time with Helen Zilla. Uh, remember Helen? Actually, I don't know if you will remember, but the predecessor to BNC was a thing called the Ibantla. And the Ibantla was started many years ago, probably 20 years ago. And we used to have a quarterly get-together of business leaders. In fact, we had Jacob Zuma there twice, once when he was deputy president, once when he was fired. We never invited him when he was president. But Helen came one night, and I remember a fascinating evening we spent together. Uh, you came and talked at the time. I can't remember exactly because it's a long time ago, but I can't remember exactly what your position was, but you were certainly in politics and senior in the, in the DA. And we sp- spoke about Scott Beck. Yes. And since then, I've been a huge fan <laughs> because Scott Beck, for anybody who knows his writing, it's very values-based, yes. very spiritual, yes. very centered, yes. and actually a, a good way of, of living one's life. He's excellent. I'd love to talk about Scott Beck again tonight, frankly. It would be a, a great advance on what we heard this morning. <laughs> well, I thought about that as well, and... From that conversation, so I'm going back into the past a great deal, to what has happened today and to somebody who's been around for as long as you have and not without a fight, sure, we understand, but you're still fighting and you're still drawing this kind of a very aggressive, antagonistic kind of commentary. So... Those, you, you, you were subjected to a lot of stuff this morning. I don't know how I'll, I'll give you the right of reply, but maybe we can just start off by saying, why did you just sit there and not grab the microphone and say, hey, you? It's because I let other people have their chance to speak. And I knew I'd have my chance tonight. And B, because... I'm used to it, and C, because I have far more supporters than I have detractors, and D, because one is often defined by one's detractors more than by one's supporters in politics, and that's a good thing. And I've been very lucky with my detractors, because it's very nice to be defined as the clear alternative to a general in the 26th gang. And it's very nice to be defined as the clear alternative to P.W. Boerter, who used to always go at me when I was a journalist, you will remember those days, and Buddy Shabon, and Jacob Zuma. And so I've been very lucky with my opponents and my enemies. And it's been almost a privilege to be defined as the opposite of what they were. I also know that you have to stand up for the truth when it matters. Now you mentioned Scott Peck. Scott Peck's first value-based piece of advice is do your best to get to the truth. Now it's very hard to get to the truth. Some people get up and say, well, I speak the truth. You speak the truth as you see it. But there are far fewer people who really work very hard to get to the truth. And no human being can get there, but some can get closer than others through very hard work. And those who do often have a lot of enemies in their time. You know, one journalist once looking at my history and my parents who, and my grandparents who stood up very much against Hitler in Germany and my whole background said to me, how come? that your family always seems to be on the right side of history. And my answer to her was, it's because you have to be prepared to be very unpopular in the present and to say things that a lot of people don't want to hear. And I'm prepared to do that. And it's because I spend a lot of time researching. It's been good to have been an investigative journalist all those years, to be guided by a set of values. And I follow that still every day in different forms and then to say well this is as close to the truth as I'm going to get here 
and I'm going to stand up for it. And in South Africa, that is going to be absolutely critical if we want to save this country. So that is why I do what I do. And I'm amazed that so many people are here tonight and aren't terrified of this 72-year-old Gogo who eats generals of the 26 gang for breakfast. <laughs> but there was a very clear message that came from both Gayton McKenzie and Herman Mashaba, and that was, we will go with the DA into a coalition provided Helen Zilla is not there. Why would that be? Why are you such a lightning rod for the leaders of those two parties who are going to be very important come 2024 or post the election? Well, we'll see about that. I think uh, some may be in some parts of the country, but we'll see. You see, time tells. I mean, you will remember when the UDM burst onto the scene and all the newspapers endorsed it and said what a wonderful movement this was. That was bound to Holomisa, Rolf Mayer at the time, black and white, two leaders together. Well, you know what came of that. You remember the independent Democrats. Perhaps you specifically remember Cope that burst onto the scene and they said, well, the DA is now dead because of Cope. Look what they're doing now. Um, they're dead. They don't exist. They can't run any processes at all. Look what happened to a Hull. So, you know, um, many parties have a certain lifespan. And before every election, new parties pop up. Unless they can build internal institutions, they don't have a long lifespan. And that is one thing that the DA really knows how to do. It's to build up internal structures, processes, systems that work in every way. And I think, you know, that was one of the things I really concentrated on when I was the leader. And everyone thinks the processes are fair, even if they sometimes don't like the outcome. And we are a democracy, so it's not Helen Zilla that's making up any of these positions. Gayton said he isn't a Democrat, and we will know that he isn't a Democrat. So what Gayton McKenzie says goes, and no one may have a different opinion. However, in the DA, I am leading the negotiating team. Yes, I am. But I get a mandate from the DA's federal executive on every single point. And on every single point, I go back to an elected federal executive. And we're going to another Congress on the 1st of April to have our leadership re-elected by a Congress that will be majority black. And I've just come from a Congress in the Eastern Cape that was significantly majority black. And we have our leaders elected. All the provinces will have their Congresses. We will have our federal Congress. And we have a democratic mandate to take clear positions. So if Gayton doesn't like, or Herman doesn't like what I say in the negotiations, well, they're clearly saying that they're not going to go into a coalition with the DA because I don't come with a personal mandate. We take this very seriously. We have spent hundreds and hundreds of hours discussing this, negotiating this, sometimes till one, two in the morning for weeks. So it's very carefully considered and all the pros and cons are looked at very, very carefully. They don't like the messenger sometimes. And we heard Gayton say how he brokered, for example, the BBEE deal with Goldfields, which was defined by the legal company in New York that examined it as a straight bribe. And if he could beat Nick Holland of Goldfields into submission, maybe he gets a bit irritated that he can't beat me into submission, which is fine. I expect someone who defines himself as an autocrat and not a Democrat to respond in that way. It's no, no surprise to me whatsoever. But he has a constituency, and that constituency will surely be very valuable to the Rainbow Coalition, as we, as we call it in, in uh, well, actually, as Cordy Mulder uh, defined it or described it. You see, he has got a constituency, and he mobilizes that constituency on race and disgruntlement. He may come here and say he's non-racist, and he doesn't believe in BBBE. But if somebody says, I've got a BBBE -E deal, can you point me in the direction of someone? He says, well, here's my girlfriend. 
you see we have these kinds of contradictions going down. So what Gaten McKenzie says to an audience of alienated people who are quick to be mobilized when you say to them, well, it's because of the foreigners in South Africa that you haven't got a job, or it's because you weren't white enough and now you're not black enough. It's the easiest trick in the book. Hitler did it very well to play to people's ethnic fears and to find a scapegoat and to mobilize around this. But let's just go back to the more fundamental point that you make. Who is keeping the ANC in power today? It's not the DA. I was fighting to get the ANC out of power when Herman Mishava was still voting for the ANC. And I just made a little list of all the places where Gaten McKenzie is supporting the ANC to be in power. Let's just look at the three big metros that have been in the news recently. Johannesburg is one of them. And I hope you'll ask me a few questions about the negotiations in Johannesburg and why we would not give the PA economic development. I'd love to talk to you about that. But in Chwani, the PA is with the ANC. In Ikuruleni, the PA is with the ANC. In Nelson Mandela Bay, the PA is with the ANC. In B2, which is the area around Platenburg Bay, the PA is with the ANC. In Neisner, the PA is with the ANC. In Tiervartus Kloof, the PA is with the ANC. In Cedarburg, we just had a big victory today where we took out the PA ANC coalition out of Cedarburg and won it back. We did exactly the same in Matsikama, where the PA is with the ANC. Those are just a few places. I can go on and on and on. So it's really rich to me that Hayden McKenzie or anybody else blames the DA for the ANC takeover of Johannesburg when Gate McKenzie did what he always said he was going to do, which was go to the PA, would go to the ANC. And in Johannesburg alone, since 2021, he has sold us out to the ANC four times, four times. The first was just after the election in 2021 where he decided to go with the ANC coalition. They were voted out and down, so he didn't get what he wanted. So we negotiated a governing coalition, and after the paper was signed and sealed, Gaten decided, well, I can be in on this. So he came along and said, I'd like to be part of your coalition. And he has eight seats in Johannesburg, which was the balance of power, so we reopened the negotiations from the beginning, despite the fact that the coalition agreement was signed and sealed. We opened them from the beginning. We negotiated very hard. They got a MACO position or an MMC position, and they swore high and low that they were with us till 2026. It didn't take five months before the ANC made them a better offer. And that it's important to just... Note that it's eight seats out of 270. Correct. Eight seats out of 270. And they had a position on the maker, which is a very high proportion. I mean, we had a very small number. We had, I think it was four in Johannesburg. Four. When we were by far the biggest party with 71 seats. So we were very generous in these negotiations. But it so happens that because we don't have any thresholds in South Africa, tiny parties and in places like Durban, for example, Etiquini, 15 one- and two-person parties hold the balance of power. And we'll come to Nelson Mandela Bay in a minute, where I spent months negotiating that 10-party coalition, which is still going on. But then, Gate McKenzie and the PA voted against us in the no-confidence vote for the Speaker, then again in the no-confidence vote against the Mayor, then we took it to court and we won that and the Mayor was back. Then they came back to us and said they would come back to us for two seats, but they insisted on which ones they should be. 
And I did a bit of research, a lot of research, in fact, and understood why they couldn't have economic development. And then they decided that they would go to the ANC because the ANC were, were offering them a better deal. So Gaten makes no secret of the fact that he goes to where the best deal lies. And it is rich that he says that the DA of all parties is putting the so-called Rainbow Coalition at risk. If you look at all of the places where the ANC is in power, if the PA has any seats at all there, it's the PA that is supporting them in power. In J.B. Marx, which is the Poch of Sturm, they've got two seats. The ANC needs those two seats because they're one short of a majority. Who does the PA put into power? The ANC. Before we go back onto the reason why you were not prepared to give him the economic development post in Johannesburg and, and, and in more detail there. And for those who are, and there are some people here from abroad, Johannesburg is the richest city in South Africa, so a critical part of the puzzle of the South African story. On a number of occasions today, it was said that you will do a deal with the ANC after the 2024 election. In other words, the DA is open to doing a deal with the ANC, perpetuating the criminal syndicate, as you have described them, for years already. The one thing about Herman Mashaba, and I know you've got differences, and I think the whole of South Africa hopes you overcome those differences, but the one thing about him is consistently said, we will never, ever deal with the ANC. We will never go into bed with the ANC. So... Just clarify, maybe for us, for for the constituents, potential DA voters who are in this room and many who will be watching this in due course, what is the position of the Democratic Alliance with the ANC as a potential coalition partner? Well, let me first deal with another thing about uh, Herman. Yesterday, you will know that we were trying to get the very competent and able Celia Brunk elected as the mayor of Chwani. At least four members of Action South Africa voted for the ANC's candidate in that election. So before people start being holier than thou, I think it's quite important to um, perhaps sweep before their own door. But it was a secret ballot. It was a secret ballot, but it is crucially important to know that when you say never ever, especially when it's the day after that happened, one must just be a little bit cautious. And Herman was very clear that they will do deals with the EFF and did do deals with the EFF while he was the mayor of Johannesburg. He clarified that for us. Mm -hmm. He said they will never do a deal with the EFF at national level. But at local level is just as bad. It's not only about filling potholes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. It's about, the EFF's very, very good at this. They are after appointing the right people in the key strategic positions in the administration, where the tenders are allocated, where the things are allowed to happen. Now, the EFF and the DA, when I was no longer the leader, decided to work together in Johannesburg. And it was the biggest strategic mistake we've ever made. And Herman was the mayor, and he needed their support to get budgets through, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then quid pro quo start happening. And that is how Floyd Brink, for example, got appointed. Now, I don't have to go into too many details about the relationship between Floyd Brink and Julius Malema and what happened in... Limpopo, but there's a rich history there. There is a rich history about the EFF's demands around insourcing, for example, around taking no action against land invasions, around tenders and contracts, mm -hmm. and key people who take those decisions being positioned in the administration. So don't ever think that local government is just about potholes and streetlights. It is about often 
for many parties, and I'm not saying it was like that for Action South Africa, but it was definitely like that for the EFF, is how you can siphon off resources in key places by having the right people positioned there. And you can never, ever do a deal with the EFF. We learned that the hard way. We decided to draw a line under it. And it was before long that Herman's own caucus was saying he's the EFF's mayor. He goes to the EFF caucus more than he comes to us. We hear about things afterwards. We often hear things from the EFF that he's going to do. And if you want to pass budgets, you have to make huge concessions. So it is true, and he is right, that there was going to be a motion of no confidence in him. And by that stage, he had alienated so many of his corpus that he probably would have been voted out. And the reason that he left had nothing to do with me. I wasn't even the leader at that stage. So why are you the lightning rod? It's an interesting thing. It's because I suppose I get put on the front line in these negotiations, and I do draw the line. I know where the line is, and I don't cross it. And I won't buckle. I take um, Thomas Jefferson's words very seriously, and he said, on matters of style, go with the current. On matters of principle, stand like a rock. And I know what a principle is when I see one. You were two years ago, uh, sorry, a year ago, at this conference, uh, BNC3, you took us through the options of the EFF and the DA, and that was really, at the end of the day, the voting option. But, but I must come back to the ANC yes, story. Going, Where are you, Where are you on that? that? You know, it's very interesting that I have spent months negotiating a 10-party coalition in Nelson Mandela Bay to keep the ANC out. And just last week I was there again doing a coalition oversight group to maintain that coalition and to help keep the ANC out. It would have been a whole lot easier to have said to the ANC, well, why don't we just do a deal and keep all these tiny little parties on the sideline? Much easier. So if we wanted to put the ANC in, we could have done it wherever. Johannesburg, Fureleni. Why are we battling so hard to put together these multi-party coalitions that in most cases are a disaster? I think we started thinking that coalitions were a bit too easy. And it's interesting that um, people talk to me as if I don't understand coalitions as if I don't understand the art of compromise. I mean, I did the first big coalition in South Africa in 2006. The DA got 42% of the vote in Cape Town. We needed six other parties to get to 49%. We had a minority coalition. I was the mayor with a seven-party coalition, which we kept going through a full term. A minority coalition became a majority coalition. And then we won an outright majority. And in 2009, we won the Western Cape with an out, outright majority because the residents of Cape Town, who constitute a very large slice of the voters of the Western Cape, thought that things looked so much better for them under a DA-led coalition. And so I know about coalitions. I know about very difficult coalitions. I know about how to keep them going under very complex circumstances which means you have to know how to compromise. You have to know how to be pragmatic, but you also have to recognize where the lines of principle are and not cross them. And so that's what we did. And um, it worked very well for us. And we thought it was going to be a very easy recipe to replicate. And history since then has judged that it is extremely difficult to replicate. And this month, March, is very nostalgic for me because it'll soon be 17 years to the day that I became mayor of Cape Town in that seven-party coalition. So I do know something about coalitions. And because we've been in government most of the time with a clear majority in Cape Town for 17 years, you're seeing the difference, a big difference. I mean, yesterday, the quarterly labor force survey came out. Now, if you're a politician, you follow the quarterly labor force survey very, very carefully because it tells you whether jobs are being created or lost in the economy. And if you care about the poor, you always want to see which way the needle is moving. And it was very good to see that in the last three months of last year, 
the economy created 169,000 jobs, which was great. But out of that 169,000, 167,000 jobs was created in the Western Cape. Now, only 2,000 2, jobs were created in all the eight other provinces put together. So if you ask me, which party is pro-poor? It is the party that creates the conditions for job creation, for people to get into jobs and to get out of poverty. The DA is the most pro-poor party there is. Now, let me come back to your question about the ANC, because I see you want to go back there, and I will go back there. I will go back there. My first answer to you is that we have done everything to keep the ANC out, more than any other party, and we, in fact, have destroyed the ANC effectively in the Western Cape. When they lose power and lose patronage, they collapse. And now they can't even hold a Congress in the Western Cape. And what's more, I started every single branch from crossroads to the other side of Kailicha in all the Tosa speaking wards. I started them when, I, when that was my constituency when I was an MP. And today we've got far more branches in those areas than the ANC has. So I've done worked my whole life to keep the ANC out. The worst of all possible worlds after 2024 will be an ANC EFF coalition. That will be the worst of all possible worlds. And we all have to do whatever we can to prevent that. Sadly, we've seen through moves not of our own that parties have enabled the ANC EFF coalition to come to power in Johannesburg. It's going to happen in Mukhali. It happened yesterday in Chorney. Not the DA doing that. We're fighting that. The best of all possible worlds is for the DA to get an outright majority. And we got an outright majority here at the last election in Umgeni. And Chris Papas is doing a great, great job. Now that's a 74% black municipality. And he won an outright majority. We've had an outright majority for years and years in Midvale. We see how well that's going there and how low the unemployment rate is there. We've got an overall majority in Kocha, in the Eastern Cape, and in many, in many municipalities in the Western Cape. Gaten sucked a, uh, a number out of his thumb. We've got 16 clear majorities in the DA. The rest of our 38 governments are coalitions, some working very well, some working very badly. Now, working back from that, these unstable, terrible coalitions are a really, really bad option. And more and more, we would rather be in opposition than be in those coalitions, because the DA has only got one brand, and that is where we govern, we govern better. And in some of those coalitions, it is impossible to govern better. In Ikuruleni, we faced votes of no confidence every single council meeting. And there is a completely captured administration that looks like ESCOM from the inside. You can do absolutely nothing. So the mayor's like Andre de Reiter. You can get nothing done because the whole thing's captured and all the whole criminal syndicates have got all their tenders and contracts. So it's best not to be in these incredibly tenuous minority coalitions. It's better to be in opposition there. We've learned that lesson, and very hard. So that's also a bad option. Being in an opposition coalition that can be stable, in which we can deliver good governance, is a not bad option. And we work back from the worst possible option to the best possible option. If we don't get an overall majority, then there's never only one choice of coalitions, there are many. You can do the sums and slice and dice in several ways. And in every single province, we will look at what the least worst option is, just as John said. That's the DA's position. And so we can't possibly say before what we'll do. We'll do the least worst. And the least worst will at least seek to keep the ANC EFF coalition out of power. But I think, Alec, I need to tell you about what 
the second best solution to a DA overall majority is. Second best. And it is this. Many of you will have been following the newspapers and reading the opinion polls. And you'll have read, if you read Rapport, which I do every week, you will have read that the ANC now regularly falls under 40% of voters who are planning to vote for the ANC. And on a good day, the DA is less than 10 percentage points behind the ANC. Less than 10 percentage points behind the ANC. We've never come that close. And then we poll all parties. So a total of approximately 12% on the average day, 12% of voters say they're going to vote for one of these very small parties who individually are not even going to get 2% of the vote. Now, you can do the sums. If 12% of voters say they're going to vote for tiny parties, if those 12% who, most, if those 12 who mostly cannibalize the DA's votes, they mostly cannibalize the DA's votes, if they would consolidate behind the one party that can beat the ANC into second place, we would do that. And if the ANC is beaten into second place, that is the big game changer. Because with a strong anchor tenant, a big party, a principled party, a party that knows how to govern, a non-racial party, and I hope you'll ask me a few questions about that, because I've got all the Social Research Foundation statistics on diversity in political parties. A non-racial party, a party that knows how to govern a principled party, if that party were to emerge as the biggest party in South Africa, that would be the real game changer. So I'm trying to see through the code. No code. And what, no code. what, what I'm reading is you will go for the least worst option post-2024. Correct. And if that means keeping the EFF out of government by doing a deal with the ANC, you will do that. As the second worst option. That is the second worst option. We will try everything else before that, including going into opposition rather than that. Because what we heard today from Gayton McKenzie was that his, his partners, the ANC, because he says he sits with these guys, and we know that the discretion is not on, uh, on top of their priority list. They are so looking forward to doing something of that nature with the DA because they will be able to run you in the way that they want to. Have you ever heard of misinformation campaigns? The only people who are keeping the ANC in power right now is Gate McKenzie. And so obviously, you know, the ANC says this to divide and rule and that to divide and rule. I don't take it seriously. I speak for the DA and I know what the DA says. Helen, when I recently moved to the Western Cape, and it has been like moving from one country to another. It truly has been. Uh, I love Johannesburg, and I still do love Johannesburg, and we still have many friends there, but it, it is this frog in a boiling pot scenario where you, until you see something completely different, it's very difficult to realize there is something different. Many people in South Africa know this. They see Cape Town works. They see the Western Cape works. And there is a huge difference. Again, now you've just emphasized it with the employment figures, the latest employment figures. Those are, those are crazy. 169,000 jobs, of which all but 2,000 were created in one of the nine provinces. Why can't the DA take that, take that prospectus, take that template, and get 70% of the vote in South Africa? Because it, on rational grounds, it should be a slam dunk. Well, not many people vote on rational grounds. I mean, you can say that as much as you like, but then uh, Gate and McKenzie will go to an area and say, you're poor because the white people aren't, and you're poor because they're foreigners here, and they are taking your jobs, and I will make sure that if a foreigner is in, an, in a hospital, I will turn off their oxygen, and I will bring God back into schools. How do you counter that? Yeah, you know, liberals have one major failing. They expect everybody to be fair and rational. 
And I do that too, and I can't get out of it. It's the way I was raised. And I will always be fair to everybody, and I will always be rational, and people will always know why I say what I say. And if they can come to me with a better argument, I will change my mind, and I will change my position. But I'm not a pushover. And, you know, slowly but surely, we are making great progress. I, you know, you don't win a 74% black municipality unless a hell of a lot of people are being convinced. You don't... I mean, let me give you another classic example. There's a lack of good froki in Mampumalanga where he's not fun on Fiachobla. The overseas people here, so I'm presuming I can't carry on the story in Afrikaans because it sounds much better in Afrikaans, but I'll say it in English. And we have a very strict merit selection for our councillors. Not that we always get it right, not that we always get it right, but we've also got accountability systems. Remember I said we've got systems and processes in the DA. We're not perfect. We're fallible human beings. And Anfia Frobler put her hat in the ring to stand in a 100% black ward in Mpumalanga. And the selection, the sifting committee, the screening committee sat, she got through that. The selection panel sat, not only did she get through that with all the really tough questions and assignments on the ward and everything that she had to do, she came top. And because we're a non-racial party, she was our candidate. And she won that ward, 100% black South Africans. Now, that's spectacular, and that's exactly where we want to be. Last night, I was speaking at a public meeting, a packed-out public meeting, in Ward 25 in Monsenbuzi, Peter Maritzburg, which is one of the strongest DA wards in KwaZulu-Natal. And usually people are pretty apathetic in a ward like that because they think, oh, well, the DA is going to win anyway, so why worry? I was the guest speaker there. Packed out. I mean, more people in here today. Packed out. And our candidate there is Reggie Kanile. Now, there were lots of people who wanted to, to be the candidate there because it's a slam dunk ward. You're going to get elected. And we went through our processes, tough questions. I know how tough they are, because in my job, I have to write them. And only I know what they are, and they're in different categories, leadership, political knowledge, knowledge of the ward, past experience, all of that stuff. And then you have to do an assignment in front of the panel and everything. Reggie Kanile came top. Reggie Kanile is our candidate in, I think, an almost 100% white ward. It's not entirely 100% white ward, but nearly. Now, there's no 100% white anything anymore. There's 100% black places, but not 100% white places, which is a good thing. And long may it be like that and increase like that because we're a very committed to non-racialism. And Reggie's our candidate. There. He gave a brilliant speech last night explaining why he's so committed to non-racialism. Now, we will get there. The founding father of our party, who was... A farmer from the Free State, Yanni Statler. I don't know if you're old enough to remember him, but I do. I do, this Gogo does. He said, one day South Africa will be governed by our principles because it is the only way it can be governed. And that is true. And people will see that more and more. And more and more people will see that good governance matters. I mean, those employment statistics tell you exactly why it matters. And for example, being two stages less on load shedding because we have developed our hydroelectric scheme at the Steenbros Dam. I came here, there's water pouring over a weir. Where's your hydroelectric scheme here? We've got far less water. We're a dry, dry, dry province. Here you're seething with water. And I hope you asked me a lot of questions about electricity and other things, but um, I'll tell you what we're doing and what we're going to do. But we're not giving me a very long list, Helen. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, you must, you know, get with the, I'll, I'll be yeah. on. <laughs> but we've been getting the regulatory environment right for 10 years. I set up Green Cape as an entity. They've been driving all of these things. It's going. 
everything is there. That's what you can do when you've been there for 17 years. Then you can start making really big progress. And the difference will become clearer and clearer. Of course, we have shacks. And we have more and more shacks because people come to Cape Town looking for work. They do. But people who live in shacks have refuse removal, have water, have electricity. We were the first people who gave people living in shacks electricity. They have public transport. They have schools and clinics. No government can deliver you a three-bedroom house and a garage and a car. That an economy has to do over time. We do basic services, and you get those right, and you transform the lives of poor people especially, because middle-class people can buy those services in the private sector. That's why we started the Metro Police, that is having more success than the South African police now. We've, we've got Ian Cameron tomorrow morning, Good. which uh, is going to be quite a He'll be an great. interesting He'll discussion be great. as well. He'll be great. On that topic. Good. But a lot of what you've said now, um, I, I think, is well known by this audience. What is not as well known is, and what, what they're fearful of, and what many people in South Africa are fearful of, you mentioned Eskom, and we, can, we will talk about that in a moment, is how long will it take South Africans to get to Yanni Statler's ideal? In other words, and I'll put it differently, when Richard Quest was in South Africa recently, I had a, a, a chat with him. He was in Cape Town. He loved it. He, of course, was appalled by the load shedding. And I asked him towards the end about the, the moving towards a, a different type of democracy in South Africa, i.e. where the ANC is no longer in power. And he said he's, from his global experience, and I, I know he's an outsider, but he put it really well, he said that if that were to happen the young democracy would have to act more or act older than its age. So, so it's almost like you've been at this now for decades. We've seen the progress. You're, there, there's no question about what has been achieved. But are we at, at a kind of tipping point potentially, which could see a dramatic change in 2024? Or does politics not work that way? Well, you know, how does the liberation get, liberation movement get beaten? First very slowly and then quickly. It's the same way people go bankrupt. So that's how it happens. And it's gathering momentum. There's no question about that. And the NC is going to fall under 50%, and it may even fall under 40% in the next election. And it certainly will do that in some provinces. But, you know, I look at Johannesburg. Now, in Johannesburg... We got delivered a nine-party coalition, folks, and a nine-party minority coalition if you're not going to succumb to what effectively is extortion. And I don't succumb to extortion. And people then in Johannesburg expect the DA to bring miracles. I say, guys, 26% of you voted for us. Now, voters can vote for whoever they like. They're free to vote for whomever they like. But then they mustn't be surprised at the government they get. Now, if you've got 26%, and I often say it this way, it's very simple. If every person who voted DA just persuades one other person who didn't vote DA to vote DA, we get an overall majority. And then you're talking then we can fix things. Then we can do what happened in Cape Town. It's going to take much more time in Joburg because, you know, when I became the mayor, it was difficult. And I took over from the ANC. Things were pretty broken. But they weren't nearly as devastated as they are in Johannesburg. And the administration would still have some understanding about the separation between party and state, which is another core principle of the DA, which very few other parties uphold. And they would understand that the job of the administration is to implement the policies of the party that won the election. Huh. We're a million miles away from that in many of the other governments that we take over. And to try and fix that on a nine and ten party coalition, I'm telling you, is impossible. So are you going to continue doing nine and ten party coalitions in the long-term uh hope that what happened in Cape Town and what 
hopefully, in, from your perspective, is happening in uh, Nelson Mande Mandela Bay can be replicated? Well, Nelson Mandela Bay is a very special case. And let me explain to you why that has a chance of working. I'm not 100% sure that it will, and I'll tell you why. The MEC for Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs in the Eastern Cape has threatened to change the system of government in Nelson Mandela Bay from an executive mayoral system to an executive committee system. Now, that is very significant because in an executive mayoral system, we can have a 10-party coalition where the DA got 40% of the vote and it takes nine other parties to get to 50% of the vote. And five of those parties have only one public representative who on their own can decide whether the ANC or the DA governs Nelson Mandela Bay, which is the very opposite of democracy. We'll leave that there. And if the Section 12 notice were to change the status of Nelson Mandela Bay to an executive committee system, they would all be out of their lucrative positions as members of the mayoral committee, and it would be put together by proportional representation, which would mean that the DA would have the same number of seats as the ANC, because we got 40%, we beat the ANC there, they got 39%, we got 40%. And then there'd be one other party that would get one seat, and that would be the Northern Alliance. Now, in our, none of those smaller parties want that system because they know they'll lose their positions. So they are working like hell to keep the coalition going because the DA is fighting the reassignment under the Section 12 notice. So we go into court to fight for all of them, and they see us as defending their positions. That's why they can understand the coalition and not play games. Because they know the minute they play games and the Section 12A notice goes through because the MEC says, look, it's totally unstable and I have to change the system of government, <laughs> then they lose their jobs. So Nelson Mandela Bay is a special case. And because of that pressure, most of them stay in. But guess which one is giving us hard times? The only one that has a chance of a position under the ANC and the DA if it was an executive committee system. And the ANC is now very cleverly saying, we will put smaller parties as the mayor. That's why they put Copes Makwarela in as the mayor, in because they're trying to make sure that all the support, the small parties will come to them after the next election. So in all these places with the multiple things, they're saying to all of the smaller parties, come to us, we'll look after you. And we're going to make you mayors. They're going to, they've offered the ATM, the mayor in Mahali City now. And they've gone to the NA, which is the only other party, except for the DA and the ANC, that will have a position on the executive committee if it comes into office. And they say to them, we'll make you the mayor. And so guess which is the only party that's giving us problems in the 10-party coalition? The one that knows that they could be a mayor if the Section 12A notice goes through. So that is how it works, folks. And we are there trying to talk about principles and policies and values. That is how it works with 90% of them. And the ANC knows that. And don't think that brown envelopes don't pass under the table. You know, I told you I was in the Mzunduzi. Now, Mzunduzi got two by-elections coming up next week, Wednesday, the 8th of March. One of them is in Ward 2 and one of them is in Ward 25. The DA is very likely to win Ward 25 and the IFP could take Ward 2 off the ANC. That means the ANC will need a coalition to stay in power. It already does. It's, of course, one of the small parties went with the ANC. Always happens. Always happens. Now they say to us, and that was me last night, Helen, will you go into a coalition there? And I looked at the numbers and I said, this will take another 10-party coalition without any of the contextual factors that are keeping the coalition alive. Now, I go back to the FedEx, not my choice. We've got democratic systems in the DA. And like Durban, I say, these are the facts, these are the figures, these are the numbers. Do we go into coalition here? And I can tell you right now, the FedEx is going to say over our dead body, we stay in opposition there. Why? Because we cannot govern in that situation. Because every second day, someone else will get a bigger offer from the ANC 
and our government will be totally unstable. We can't govern like that. We just cannot live from council meeting to council meeting wanting to know which person has now been extorted, which person has now got a better offer. No. So we the people need to wait. No, need you the people have to vote for the only party that can bring good governance. But it's going to require patience, potentially beyond 2024. Well, we're going to have to see. I mean, you know, um, if we go to stage eight load shedding, which the criminal cartels in which two cabinet ministers are involved will take us to if they can make a few extra billion, people might get peed off enough to um, to get the ANC at around 37% and then everything can change. And if we can consolidate the opposition vote rather than fracture it, a hell of a lot can change. You know, voters get the government they vote for.